family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is part two of chapter three. From private family responsibility to public responsibility for the family. The question of personal and, by extension, family responsibility was central to early 20th century debates surrounding the introduction of modern social welfare. The comprehensive forms of social insurance that had been implemented in Germany under Otto von Bismarck as early as the 1880s and in other European states throughout the following decades were much slower to be accepted in the United States, where they had to overcome both elite and popular attachment to notions of free labor and family self-sufficiency. Throughout the early 20th century, Opponents of social welfare, which included many associated with the scientific charity movement, argued that the socialization of risk would destroy the family as a moral institution by displacing economic solidarity among kin. Even public assistance to non-contributing dependents, such as widows and the aged, was attacked as a threat to the values of family responsibility and self-support. One exemplary American critic of the European welfare state warned that the introduction of social insurance against old age, workplace accidents, and illness would constitute a most serious evil, moral as well as economic. It would exert an, an enervating and demoralizing influence upon character, lessening the sense of personal responsibility and self-reliance, and sapping the foundations of individual initiative and ambition. In a similar fashion, it was argued, public assistance to single mothers and the aged would weaken the bonds of family solidarity. It would take away, in part, the filial obligation for the support of aged parents, which is one of the main ties that holds the family together. The assumption by the state of the obligation to support uh, the aged in their homes would undermine filial responsibility, precisely as the guarantee of public maintenance of children would destroy parental responsibility. Such views were shared by many in the trade union movement, who were equally invested in the idea that independent working men should be able to earn a breadwinner wage without help from the state. The progressive advocates of social insurance retorted that the old family responsibility laws were themselves destructive of the bonds of kinship. Too often, they argued, the market price of labor and hence the actual wage earned by the male worker fell far below the level required to sustain a family. Both supporters and opponents of social insurance saw the family as the foundation of moral and economic life, differing only in their views on the proper relationship to be established between the family and the state. Opponents harked back to a Gilded Age conception of family self-sufficiency that made the independent male worker privately responsible for supporting his, in his dependents. Supporters argued that the modern conditions of industrial life necessitated a much more sustained governmental effort to underwrite the risks of the male wage. If the former saw economic security as the private responsibility of the family, the latter wanted to transform the family into a public responsibility, indeed the prime welfare function of the state. By underwriting the unavoidable risks of the labor market, they argued a full-fledged social welfare system would guarantee the male breadwinner wage and ensure that the wives of working class men would not have to go out to work themselves. Neither, however, questioned the centrality of the family within their vision of economic life, much less the dependence of women within this institution. With the passage of the Social Security Act in 1935, the advocates of social insurance claimed a decisive victory. The New Deal introduced comprehensive forms of social insurance against workplace accidents, unemployment, and aging, and definitively removed one class of workers, standard white male workers, from the poor law system of family responsibility. Hoping to capitalize on this victory, federal administrators on the Social Security Board launched a vigorous assault on state poor laws over the following years and sought as far as possible to limit their use. Yet many states resisted these intrusions and continued to enforce family responsibility and public assistance programs for the non-working and non-contributing poor. By all accounts, these provisions were enforced with greater frequency after World War II, 
as social wel- welfare costs began to escalate. <clears throat> the dividing line between federal social insurance programs and state-governed public assistance became increasingly meaningful in this period. At a time when the government was assuming full social responsibility for standard male workers and their dependents, public assistance claimants were relegated to an older tradition of private, albeit state-enforced, family obligations. As noted by one contemporary legal scholar, the inclusion of a family responsibility provision in general assistance law has given rise to the assumption that family responsibility for dependent persons is primary, that public responsibility is secondary, and that public assistance, therefore, cannot be given until all possibility of securing support under the family responsibility laws has been exhausted. When single mothers, the blind, the disabled, the mentally ill, or the indigent claimed public assistance, state welfare departments were authorized to investigate and enforce private family obligations before dispersing any public funds. An adult child could be brought to court to pay for an elderly parent's nursing home costs, aunts and uncles held accountable for the costs of housing and educating a blind relative, and parents forced to contribute to the care of an insane child. In some states, the welfare department could claim retrospective compensation for benefits paid or seize the estate of a deceased claimant to reimburse the public purse. Although the maintenance of these laws was typically justified on fiscal grounds, most commentators agree that their effect was above all punitive and disciplinary. The costs of administrative action meant that states saved little money by pursuing and extracting funds from relatives who were often poor themselves. Instead, the laws served to deter potential recipients from claiming welfare in the first place and reinforced the idea that for the undeserving poor, the private family unit was the first and only source of economic security. By the 1960s, family responsibility responsibility laws were once again coming under attack, this time from organizations representing the disabled, the blind, and the aged. The case of California is particularly instructive in this regard, given the thoroughly progressive nature of the reforms it undertook in this era and their subsequent reversal under the governorship of Ronald Reagan. In 1961, the California state legislature completely abolished family responsibility clauses in its public assistance programs for the blind and disabled, while restricting their use in programs for the mentally ill, the aged, and the indigent. In, indigent. <laughs> I don't like that word. In a landmark decision handed down in 1964, Department of Mental Hygiene v. Kirchner, the California Supreme Court prohibited the Department of Mental Hygiene from charging relatives of the mentally ill for state hospital costs. In defense of its position, the court argued that poor law provisions constituted a form of unfair taxation and were not compatible with the redistributive principles of the Social Security Act. The ruling was profoundly significant, not only because it placed the undeserving beneficiaries of public assistance on the same legal footing as the deserving workers covered by the more respectable federal system of social insurance, but also because it challenged the very constitutionality of family responsibility laws, a challenge that could potentially be extended to all public assistance programs. In 1965, Congress appeared to sound the death knell of family responsibility laws when it ruled that no state would be allowed to recoup costs from family members in the context of the new Medicaid program. Reiterating the arguments made by progressive advocates of social insurance in the first decades of the 20th century, supporters of this, of this decision contended that the inclusion of such clauses in the new Medicaid program would be destructive of family relationships. During this period of rapid liberalization, only the much maligned AFDC program remained firmly embedded in the poor law tradition. Far from phrasing out the family responsibility provisions of AFDC, state legislatures continued to strengthen them after World War II, reinforcing the idea that impoverished women should look to individual men and not the state as sources of support. As we have seen, substitute father or man in the house rules had been imposed on welfare mothers since the beginning of the program, serving to create a 
a de jure relationship of paternal and marital responsibility where none had been consented to by the parties concerned. From the 1950s onward, many states, including California, extended their family responsibility laws to include absent fathers. The former husbands of women who had been separated or divorced or the biological fathers of children who had been born out of wedlock now more than ever, or that had been born out of wedlock, period. Now more than ever, women were reminded that their economic welfare depended primarily on their legal connection to a man. Yet the fortunes of AFDC changed dramatically around 1965, thanks in large part to the rise of a new kind of public interest lawyer. lawyer working in close collaboration with the nascent welfare rights movement. Beginning in 1965, President Johnson's Office of Economic Opportunity created and funded hundreds of legal service offices around the country with the express aim of providing free legal aid to the poor. These offices would become major players in the legal struggle for welfare, welfare reform, initiating most of the AFDC-related test cases that came to court over the next decade or so. Their signature strategy of test case law reform was devised by a small group of scholars based at the Columbia Center for Social Welfare Policy and Law, CSWPL, who collaborated closely with activists in the welfare rights movement and soon became experts in the intricacies of welfare law. In mounting their case against public assistance laws, these lawyers looked to recent changes in family law as a model of the kinds of freedoms that might also be extended to those on welfare. Family law was effectively undergoing an extraordinary process of liberalization during this period. After more than a century of little change at all, laws that limited divorce, stigmatized non-marital unions, and discriminated against illegitimate children were repealed or ceased to be enforced within the space of a decade or so. Alongside the marginalization of older, status-based rules governing sexual relationships, a new jurisprudence came into being that explicitly recognized sexual freedom as a constitutionally protected right. In two landmark decisions, Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965 and Eisenstadt v. Baird in 1972, the Supreme Court fashioned a new right to privacy that limited the power of the state to police intimate sexual relationships in the home. Yet none of these innovations extended to impoverished women on welfare who were regularly subject to salacious investigations into their sexual histories, unannounced home visits, and strict moral policing under state law. As the field of family law entered a new age of relative sexual freedoms, welfare law, aptly dubbed the family law of the poor by legal scholar Jacobus Tenbrook, continued to reflect the punitive moral conservatism of the poor law tradition. Relaying the most radical voices in the welfare rights movement, progressive public interest lawyers questioned why recipients of public assistance and public housing were still subject to such intrusive forms of moral surveillance. If the Supreme Court now recognized a constitutional right to sexual privacy, why would this right not be extended to women on welfare? If middle-class women were now free to dissolve marriages at will and had increasing power to earn an independent wage in the labor market, why should poor women remain imprisoned within the private bonds of economic dependence? If marriage no longer counted in determining the legal status of middle-class children, why would the children of welfare mothers still be classified as illegitimate and punished for the sins of the parents? In short, poverty lawyers were looking to the liberalization of family law to argue against the continuing enforcement of private familial obligations in the realm of welfare. The institutional and judicial environment of the 1960s was extraordinarily conducive to such ambitious social reform agendas. Public interest litigators who sought to reform welfare found an unusually receptive audience in the progressive Warren Court and the even more liberal California Supreme Court. They also had numerous sympathizers among federal administrators in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, um, H-E-W, or HEW, who sometimes initiated their own test cases against the punitive welfare laws imposed by state legislatures. Their strategy of test case litigation turned state public assistance into a federal issue, forcing the Supreme Court to pass judgment on matters it would rarely have encountered in the past – 
Having ignored AFDC during its first few decades of existence, the U.S. Supreme Court presided over a full 18 cases relating to the program between 1968 and 1975, while the lower federal courts issued hundreds of relevant decisions during the same period. The outcome of these decisions was both to federalize and thus liberalize control of welfare and to align its provisions with recent changes in family law. In the King v. Smith case of 1968, Chief Justice Earl Warren ruled that Alabama's substitute father rule violated the terms of the Social Security Act and was out of touch with family law, which no longer sought to punish extramarital relations and no longer recognized any valid status distinction between legitimate and illegitimate children. In another decision, Justice Brennan opposed child support enforcement as an invasion of privacy. The lower federal courts were especially aggressive in overturning the poor law provisions of state welfare programs. In the wake of the King v. Smith decision to invalidate substitute father rules, the lower courts went on to outlaw all state rules compelling women to track down absent fathers as sources of support. As a result of these rulings, the number of welfare applicants who refused to cooperate with district attorneys in child support matters rose dramatically. By themselves, these decisions might have remained at the level of formal change, an affirmation of juridical rights without substantive impact on the everyday lives of women on welfare. But combined with the significant presence of welfare rights groups in local communities, women were becoming increasingly educated in the intricacies of welfare law and emboldened to contest their treatment at the hand of social workers. By placing welfare benefits on a more secure footing and ridding them of punitive behavioral rules, the federal court decisions of this era had the effect of liberating women from the confines of private family dependence. The overall message conveyed by these rulings was that the welfare of poor women was a public responsibility on a par with that of standard male workers. Whatever their marital status, sexual history, or race, impoverished women were just as deserving of a social wage as any other citizen. At a time when middle-class women were entering the workforce in growing numbers, and achieving some degree of economic independence from men, unmarried women on welfare also appeared to be in reach of a social wage that was no longer mediated through a substitute husband. For an all-too-brief moment, revised AFDC rules allowed divorced or never-married women and their children to live independently of a man while receiving a state-guaranteed income free of moral conditions. Public assistance benefits, however menial, were functioning like a social wage for unmarried women, a configuration that had not been envisaged in the Social Security Act, and one that many perceived as a perversion of its original intent. In a period when employment opportunities and access to higher education for both white and non-white women were expanding as never before, this was a profoundly liberating development. It is this, perhaps, that accounts for the extreme violence of the anti-welfare backlash that unfolded over the following years. As Stephanie Kuntz points out, it was not so much women's dependence on the state that provoked the outrage of neoliberals and neoconservatives. Their alleged dependence, after all, was nothing compared to that of standard male workers. It was rather the growing realization that welfare was making women independent of individual men and freeing them from the obligations of the private family that turned a generation of social reformers against the welfare state, tout court. Reflecting on the profound changes to family and welfare law that had taken place in the 1970s, one of President Reagan's closest advisors, the social conservative Gary Bauer, would look back and remark ruefully that the cumulative message of these cases reverberates today. Taken together, he observed, these and other decisions by the Supreme Court had crippled the potential of public policy to enforce familial obligations demand family responsibility, protect family rights, or enhance family identity. The only logical response he believed was, was to attempt to revive the old family responsibility laws at both the state and federal level. Reagan himself appears to have reached the same conclusion a decade previously during his term as governor of California. Um... Regan in California, um, reviving family responsibility laws. Of the welfare rights movement 
or if the welfare rights movement had been particularly successful in California, it was also here, under the governorship of Ronald Reagan, that it suffered its first substantial backlash. When Reagan was first elected governor in 1966, California had one of the most generous AFDC programs in the country, and caseloads were rising rapidly. By the time of his second election campaign, Reagan, who was now among the most vocal Republican opponents of Nixon's expanded, wage, or expanded family wage, made revision of the state welfare program his overwhelming priority. At a time when the Supreme Court and Congress were attempting to federalize AFDC and wrest it from state control, Reagan aggressively asserted the rights of states to retain their police powers over the poor. Having first obtained a waiver from Hugh, he sought to transform California into a laboratory for punitive welfare reform that could then be translated onto the national stage. In the midst of his second election campaign of 1970, Regan quietly set up a special task force of conservative, conservative lawyers to review the state's public assistance programs and identify priorities for reform. After his resounding return to power, he promptly appointed one of the members of the task force as the new director of social welfare and undertook a systematic overhaul of the entire department. Anticipating later federal campaigns to defund the left by blocking the latter's access to bureaucratic power, Regan was particularly keen to purge the department of what he called professional welfareists, by which he meant state administrators with social work backgrounds. These positions were filled instead by professionals with fiscal or managerial experience who were not likely to sabotage the governor's plans for, for welfare austerity. Anticipating that any attempt at cutting back welfare would be challenged in the courts by California's various legal service offices, Regan also appointed a cadre of conservative legal profession professionals to preempt possible test cases. Having thus forestalled the possibility of any internal opposition, in 1971, Regan presented a Comprehensive Welfare Reform Act to the Democratic Party-controlled legislature, which, after extracting a few concessions, accepted it in August of that year. At the beginning of the 1970s, Regan was at odds with the political consensus on social policy. Nixon's efforts to extend the family wage to black men can be seen in retrospect as the high point of a New Deal vision of social welfare that sought to completely transcend the poor law tradition of private family responsibility. In the expansionist and optimistic atmosphere of the late 1960s, moderate Republicans and Democrats agreed that the state should assume public responsibility for the families of all men, black and white, although very few were, pre were prepared to question the dependent role of women within this arrangement. There was also a widespread recognition that the individuous or individ individuous differences what a weird word between social insurance and public assistance programs should be neutralized wherever possible. By contrast, Regan's welfare reform agenda sought to revive and extend a much older poor law tradition of public relief, with its attendant distinction distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor. In the words of Alice O'Connor, for all but the legitimately disabled, dependent, or otherwise deserving, public assistance would be a tightly regulated, temporary, relatively inexpensive, locally controlled, and heavily stigmatized, if not downright punitive, source of poor relief. Welfare in Regan's plan would return to the old poor law tradition from which decades of reform, social policy, and more recently, permissive liberal governance had allowed it to stray. In particular, Regan was intent on reviving the poor law family responsibility provisions that had only recently been expunged from public assistance programs such as AFDC. In the words of Regan's task force on welfare reform, one important theme of welfare reform was the need to establish and enforce the principle that family members are responsible for the support of relatives. In its simplest form, the argument was the every dollar contributed by the relative of a person on the welfare rolls was a dollar saved to the taxpayer. However, the welfare reform goals went further and identified the family as the basic unit in society, emphasizing increased dependence upon the family and eliminating aspects of the welfare system that constitute incentives to break up the family.
With recommendations extending to all the state's public assistance programs, Regan's welfare reform ended up reinstating family responsibility rules covering relationships between adult children and aged parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and impoverished children, parents and unwed minor mothers, as well as stepfathers and non-adoptive children. But in a move that anticipated the path of federal welfare reform over the following decades, Regan's state-level reform was most concerned with the problem of enforcing the responsibility of absent fathers to support children born out of wedlock. Sensing perhaps that the old substitute father rules would have less chance of surviving in the more permissive environment of the 1970s, conservative welfare reformers now seized upon the obligations of biological but absent fathers as the best means of reviving family responsibility laws. The authors of California's Blueprint for National Welfare Reform observed, A fundamental goal of the 1971 Welfare Reform Act was to strengthen the role of the family as the basic unit in society. The increasing occurrence of family dissolution has resulted in reliance on sorry, on public assistance instead of parental support. Absent fathers frequently fail to assume the responsibility for supporting their children. Many AFDC mothers refuse to disclose the identities of the fathers of AFDC children. The document singled out the War on Poverty's legal service offices, permissive social workers, and activist welfare mothers as behind-the-scene behind enablers of this newly recalcitrant class of welfare recipient. In an effort to obstruct this coalition of progressive forces, Regan's welfare reform of 1971 introduced a number of new reward structures to incentivize the collection of child support by county, county welfare offices. Ultimately, however, Regan and his advisors were aware that only federal reform could, permit, could permanently reverse the liberalizing trends in social welfare policy and thwart the endless court challenges by public interest lawyers. It would not take long for Congress to respond to Regan's challenge. In 1974, it passed the Child Support Act, creating a federal office of child support enforcement and requirement states and requiring states to establish their own child support offices as part of their AFDC programs. Over the following years, successive amendments, amendments would seek to further strengthen this new federal system of child support enforcement. By all accounts, however, child support remained discretionary, uneven, and haphazard. The law of family responsibility had been federalized by congressional edict, but it remained far from comprehensive on the ground. Governor Regan's dream of a fully federalized system of family responsibility would need to await the election of the new would need to await the election of the new Democrat president, Clinton, to be fully realized. Federalizing, federalizing Governor Regan's welfare reforms. In 1996, President Bill Clinton, in alliance with a Republican-dominated Congress, passed legislation promising to end welfare as we know it. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, PRWORA, Jesus Christ, replaced the Federal Welfare Program, AFDC, with a more punitive and conditional TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. Under these new funding terms, the federal government was no longer required to provide open-ended matching grants to fund state welfare programs. Instead, it would provide a finite block grant that in any given year might fall well short of covering the benefit costs of all eligible welfare applicants. As an expression of federal devolution, PRWORA purported to give the states greater freedom to pursue the kinds of policy experiments that were once only possible under federal waiver. In reality, however, welfare block grants came with strict conditions and allowed the states only the limited freedom of imposing tougher rules than those required by the federal government. Clinton's welfare reform is best known as the legislative intervention that abolished the federal entitlement to welfare benefits, introduced an absolute time limit of five years on welfare, oops, 
on welfare eligibility and required welfare recipients to engage in compulsory, compulsory work programs. Most of this unfree labor took place in the low-wage service sector, a sector already dominated by African-American, Latina, and migrant women. The imposition of workfare, workfare requirements was bound to have a devastating effect not only on the lives of welfare recipients who must fund their own child care needs while they work, or more realistically, turn to the unpaid labor of female relatives, but also on service workers in general, since the state-subsidized supply of free or low-cost labor has inevitably worsened conditions for all service workers, especially those at the lower echelons of the labor market. As Collins and Mayer remind us, the effects of welfare reform cannot be understood apart from the forces constituting demand for labor at the bottom of the labor market. After a brief period of two decades during which the relative wages and working conditions of African American women appear to be improving, the effect of workfare has been to brutally reinstate the historically racialized obligations of domestic servitude and a form that responds to the imperatives of the post Fordist service economy. African American and other minority women may well have escaped the relations of personal dependence that characterize domestic labor in white homes well into the late Fordist era. Welfare reform, however, has subjected them to new forms of unfree domestic labor outside the home, and in the process, places the labor of all other low-wage service workers under the shadow of workfare. The parallels between Clinton's workfare laws and the labor history of the Reconstruction period are striking. Just as formal emancipation quickly gave way to convict leasing, and domestic servitude mandated by the criminalization of former slaves, the formal victories of the civil rights movement have been rapidly qualified by the legitimation of various forms of unfree labor, again justified by the criminalization of impoverished minorities. The classical liberal doctrine of labor contractualism and at-will employment has never flourished without the simultaneous imposition of a poor law regime of unfree labor, today exemplified by the expansion of both feminized workfare and prison labor. It is, left, it is less often recognized, however, that the same symbiosis between contractual freedom and non-contractual non obligation applies also to the question of domestic relations. Here again, Clinton's welfare reform closely replicates the relief efforts of the Reconstruction era, much like the legal reforms that were mobilized to manage newly enfranchised slaves, PRWORA seeks to limit the potential social costs of sexual freedom among the post-civil rights poor by adapting and reinventing the family responsibility provisions of the poor law. And like the Freedmen's, and like the Freedmen's Bureau, it envisages welfare reform as a kind of demonstration project in family formation that targets African Americans in particular, but aspires in the long run to extend its lessons to the wider population. After the piecemeal amendments of previous decades, Clinton's welfare reform radically overhauled the existing child support system, transforming it into the comprehensive federal enforcement regime that Reagan had dreamt of in the early 1970s. States were compelled to harmonize and strengthen their efforts to establish paternity for all children at the moment of birth, even if their mothers weren't on the welfare rolls. Integrated databases for pursuing delinquent fathers across state lines were set up. The use of time-consuming judicial review was eliminated, and a cumbersome, fragmented, and still dis discretionary system of case-by-case -case administration was replaced with a uniform and automatic enforcement process. Each state was now required to demonstrate that it had increased paternity identifications, on an annual incremental basis until it had reached the overall goal of 90%. As under previous legislation, welfare applicants were required to cooperate with state welfare agencies in their efforts to identify and track down biological fathers. But the new rules also compelled states to sanction applicants who did not comply, either by reducing benefits or cutting them from the welfare rolls completely. These, these, and other petty sanctions led to a dramatic drop in welfare rules within the first few years of its enactment. PRWORA was no less punitive with respect to, delinqu to delinquent fathers. In 
Under its terms, under its terms, men who failed to pay child support could have their wages automatically garnished, or could be ordered by a court to undertake workfare obligations, reproducing the Gilded Age practice of exchanging family for work obligations. In some states, delinquent fathers could have their passport, driver's license, or occupational license confiscated. In other states, they could be subject to criminal sanctions. One, oh, sorry. If child support orders had once been pursued on a discretionary and haphazard basis and were rarely enforced across state lines, they had now become virtually inescapable. With respect to fathers, however, the effects of welfare reform were never simply or unambiguously punitive since they also served to reinstate the authority of men within the family. In what marks a radical departure from standard family law, welfare law derives legal fatherhood from the mere fact of a biological relationship and proceeds to enforce the resulting obligations on this basis alone. Yet even as this legal sleight of hand imposes obligations on men, it also authorizes them to claim certain exceptional rights. Once he has been named a legal father, a man can legitimately claim visitation and custody rights to his children, even if he previously had no relationship with them. This automatic ascension to the state to the status of legal fatherhood is peculiar to welfare law. Family law in general refuses to grant legal paternity to men on the simple basis of biological kinship insisting that some more solid and long-lasting emotional relationship must be established before a man can be considered a father. Only in welfare law can a man claim custody rights on biological grounds alone, an anomalous situation that clearly sanctions all kinds of abuse. The modern child support system serves to demonstrate that the state is willing to enforce, indeed create, legal relationships of, fam of familial obligation and dependence where none have been established by mutual consent. Just as the Freedmen's Bureau created legal marriages ex nihilo without bothering to secure the consent of either partner, modern-day welfare law conjures family relationships into being as a way of enforcing the legal obligations of mutual dependence and support. The entire process is of little benefit to the applicant. If the old welfare law required states to allocate a $50 pass-through portion of child support funds to the welfare claimant. This provision is now optional and states may use the funds for the sole purpose of covering their expenses. The administrative costs dedicated to the identification of fathers and collection of child support are enormous and consume a non-negligible portion of federal budget dedicated to welfare. But in spite of this, the average amounts collected on behalf of each applicant are minimal. Not surprisingly, given that absent fathers are often poor or unemployed themselves. Why not disperse welfare funds directly to impoverished women? These laws appear to be motivated as much by a will to punish and deter as any concern with fiscal burdens. By detouring the payment of welfare benefits via legally designated fathers, the state reminds women that they cannot hope to find economic security without entering a relationship of personal dependence on a man. As noted by Laura Morgan, Clinton's welfare reform represents the modern incarnation of the, of the Elizabethan poor law. The most recent and most comp comprehensive attempt to date to substitute the private responsibility of family for the public responsibility of the state. The federal welfare apparatus created by the New Deal and Great Society is here repurposed as an immense apparatus for enforcing the private family obligations of the welfare poor. Thus, a Democratic president completed the experiment in radical welfare reform that had been initiated by a right-wing Republican as far back as the 1970s. In the words of Mark Neal Aronson, the basic features of today's provisions are not very different in premise and direction from the Regan welfare reform legislation of 15 and 25 years ago. Although they are harsher on the poor in the details. Like the Regan reforms, he continues, Clinton's welfare reforms largely reflect and give renewed vitality to principles of relief, of relief giving dating back to the Elizabethan poor laws, or more approximately the American post-Civil War era and Gilded Age. In the meantime, the old terms of combat between the federal government and the states have completely shifted.
where federal administrators once sought to banish the poor law tradition from state public assistance programs, hoping instead to upgrade all welfare programs to the higher standards of social insurance. Now the federal government was itself taking the initiative and reinstating the poor laws. Where Regan once needed a federal waiver to revive the poor law tradition in California, Clinton's welfare reform now positively forced the states to implement family responsibility rules under threat of sanction. Thus, PRWORA definitively upended the traditional relationship between the historically progressive federal government and the recalcitrant states. For the first time in American social history, the old poor law tradition of of family responsibility was fully integrated into federal policy. Reporting on the progress of welfare reform in his monthly Business Weekly column, Gary Becker enthusiastically commended the workfare on familial obligations written into Clinton's proposed legislation, finding fault with them only for being too lenient. As Becker explains in a classic theoretical paper on the relationship between family and welfare, the freedom of contractual relations in the marketplace cannot be sustained without the existence of non-contractual obligations in the family. Altruistic love may well be inefficient in the marketplace, but it is absolutely necessary in the family, where biological divisions of labor related to childbearing mean that mothers stand to gain from personal dependence on a man and fathers benefit from assuming personal responsibility for the welfare of mothers and children. The problem with social welfare from this perspective is that it undermines the natural incentives to family altruism that and thus deprives the poor of their primary support system. Even as they celebrate freedom of contract in the public marketplace of love and money, Neoliberals such as Becker just as insistently affirm the necessity of of non-contractual obligation in the family and are more than willing to invoke the full power of the state to enforce it. It is here, after all, that they locate the proper locus of economic security and the ideal alternative to the social welfare state. Clinton's Welfare Reforms Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism It would be misleading, however, to assume that Clinton's welfare reform was informed exclusively by a neoliberal philosophy of private family welfare. As noted by Brenda Kosman, PRWORA represented a curious hybrid of fiscal and social conservatism, or what I would call neoliberalism and new social conservatism. The opening preamble of PRWORA thus sets out the following extraordinary definition of public morality. One, Marriage is the foundation of a successful society. Two, marriage is an essential institution of a successful society, which promotes the interests of children. And three, promotion of responsible fatherhood and motherhood is integral to successful child rearing and the well-being of children. In its findings section, the the text of the legislation goes on to cite various statistics pointing to a correlation between out-of-wedlock births, rising rates of child poverty, poor health outcomes, child abuse, criminality, and drug addiction, although no attempt is made to establish a causal relationship. In light of these findings, the legislation outlines a number of conditions that must be met before a state receives a block grant. Each state must demonstrate that it has taken action to prevent and reduce out-of-wedlock pregnancies. It must also establish numerical goals for reducing rates of illegitimate children with a $100 million, or $100 million bonus fund set aside for states that manage to reduce illegitimate births without increasing abortion rates. Beyond these preventative measures, PRWORA also includes funds to actively promote heterosexual, procreative marriage in the wider non-welfare population. It instructs the Secretary of Health and Human Services to disperse $50 to disperse $50 a million a year in block grants for abstinence-only education. What the fuck? At $50 million a year? I think there's an A between 50 and million. So I'm just going to... $50 million sounds right. $50 million a year in block grants for abstinence-only education in public schools and sets aside special budget allocations to finance marriage promotion initiatives undertaken by the states. In the words of Dorit Giva, 
No previous American welfare legislation has so decisively positioned the ethic of strong families and the importance of marriage as so fundamental to the prevention of welfare dependence. With its resounding affirmation of the social value of marriage, PRWORA reversed what had seemed to be an overwhelming trend toward the liberalization of family law. The distinction between legitimate and illegitimate children had been virtually invalidated in family law and challenged in welfare law since the 1960s. Clinton's welfare reform unequivocally reaffirmed the importance of legitimate childbearing as a goal of social policy. And if the states had long since tempered their efforts to police morality, at least in the private sphere, the federal government was now openly compelling the states to do just that under threat of funding cuts. What had once looked like a slow but irreversible trend toward the liberalization of family law was abruptly suspended as the federal government sought to bluntly reassert the non-contractual obligations of marriage and family. These impositions, of course, applied primarily to welfare recipients who had only ever enjoyed a brief respite from state police powers. Yet, as outlined in detail by Tanya Brito, many of the practical measures invented to deal with unmarried mothers on welfare have subsequently been extended to single mothers in general. In a, in a move designed to preempt any future claims to welfare benefits, period. In a process that Brittle refers to as the welfareization of family law, the long obsolete distinction between legitimate and illegitimate children is now being revived in family law in general, a shift that is perhaps best exemplified by the recent prominence of legitimacy arguments in same-sex marriage jurisprudence. The new Democrats between neoliberalism and communitarianism Here, once again, it was the Democratic President Bill Clinton who was able to fully implement a project first nourished by right-wing Republicans. As President, Ronald Reagan had struggled and failed to forge an effective political alliance between his neoliberal and social conservative constituencies. Despite the initial hopes of a lasting alliance, Reagan's social conservative supporters were just too closely aligned with the religious right and white populism to attract more than a small minority of the voting public. Accordingly, Reagan's presidential efforts to enact welfare reform were less spectacular than his achievements as as governor of California. Instead, it was Clinton who managed to form a broad bipartisan and cross-racial alliance between neoliberals and new conservatives, having first broken down the barriers to to a social conservative politics within his own party. Thus, although Clinton's welfare reform is commonly interpreted as an adaptation of Newt Gingrich's contract with America, the platform with which the Republicans had campaigned for and won the 1994 congressional elections, its passage also reflected a tectonic shift within the Democratic Party itself, as new Democrats came to exercise a growing influence on the formulation of the party's social policy goals. The New Democrats had emerged as an organized political faction in 1985 following the Republicans' resounding success in Reagan's second election campaign. Organized under the umbrella of the Democratic Leadership Council and its think tank, the Progressive Policy Institute, these new wave Democrats sought to win back their old white working class base by actively dissociating themselves from the legacy of the 1960s New Left and instead promoting a centrist, moral conservative position on social welfare. It was thanks largely to the Progressive Party Institute that the Democratic Party came to embrace the new paternalism of Lawrence Mead, arguably the single most influential advocate of workfare and punitive child support reform in recent U.S. welfare reform. The New Democrats were also responsible for establishing the Institute for American Values and its associated think tank, the Council on Families in America, within the mainstream of social policy debate. Housing such as prominent figures as... Housing such prominent... Housing such prominent figures as William Galston, Clinton's chief domestic policy advisor until 1995, David Popeno, Barbara Defoe Whitehead, Jean Bethke Elstein, Elstein, 
and James Q. Wilson, and closely associated with the communitarian philosopher Am Amide Etzioni, these organizations are committed to the project of, project of bridging the political divide between social justice progressives and religious conservatives. Much like their conservative Christian peers, the communitarian New Democrats are obsessed with the decline of marriage, rising rates of illegitimate childbearing, and the, results, and the resultant epidemic of fatherless families. But they deploy conventional social science methods to buttress their conclusions and carefully avoid the use of overtly anti-feminist, homophobic language. Indeed, some of them are recent converts to the cause of gay, of gay marriage. Hoping to wrest the discourse of family values from the religious right, these in-house scholars prefer the language of community disintegration to that of moral decline and present the loss of stable, monogamous marriage as a social justice issue rather than a symptom of cultural decadence. The Institute for American Values and its affiliates have been instrumental in placing marriage promotion and responsible fatherhood at the center of U.S. welfare reform. Their rhetoric is capacious and nonpartisan enough to speak to religious and secular conservatives, neoliberal conservatives, and those nostalgic for the New Deal family wage, as well as black and white advocates of family values. On the right, the Institute has worked closely with the National Fatherhood Initiative, NFI, a nonprofit organization, a nonprofit organization co-founded by the evangelicals Wade Horn and Don Eberly in 1994, and now a clearinghouse for responsible fatherhood programs throughout the country. The National Fatherhood Initiative is particularly focused on the alleged disintegration of the white family, a process they see as reproducing the, the black family crisis of the 1970s. Their defining moment was Dan Quayle's 1992 speech condemning the television depiction of the white single mother, Murphy Brown, and the subsequent debate it provoked in the liberal progressive press. On the center left, the Institute for American Values also works in close collaboration with representatives of the Ford Foundation's various strengthening fragile families initiatives, which focus on the problems facing low-waged African-American and other minority fathers. Fragile families advocates such as fragile families advocates such as Ronald B. Mincy and Hillard Pouncey see themselves as heirs to Moynihan. In contrast to the NFI, they are primarily concerned with the socioeconomic dynamics that have lessened the marriage ability of minority men and prevented them from fulfilling their roles as fathers. Without descending into overt anti-feminism, these scholars frame the problem of female and child poverty as stemming from the absence of economic and social opportunities for minority men, and therefore envisage the restoration of proper gender hierarchies as a necessary first step in the project of social justice. They claim that the decline of the industrial economy and secular expansion of the service sector have privileged minority women over men, once again creating the conditions in which black fathers are forcibly excluded from matriarchal families. Ultimately, as heirs to Moynihan, they envisage work cre creation and educational programs on a scale not seen since the Great Society as the ideal solution to the problem of fatherless families. But in the absence of any real political will in this direction, they have focused their efforts on making the child support system less punitive toward minority men. Working in close association with state welfare offices, they have established responsible fatherhood programs within the child support system, allowing courts to send a delinquent parent to fatherhood classes in lieu of severe sanctions. Thanks to the influence of the Fragile Families Coalition, the connections between family responsibility, criminal sanction, and imprisonment have in recent years morphed into a more rehabilitative vision of responsible fatherhood while remaining firmly embedded in the criminal justice system. These left and right incarnations of family values politics came to fruition under the Bush and Obama administrations as federal agencies began to fully implement the social conservative promise of Clinton's welfare reform. Shortly after arriving in office, George W. Bush appointed the right-wing evangelical Wade Horn, former president of the National Fatherhood Initiative, 
as Director of the Administration for Children and Families. The bureau within the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, that administers TA and F. Under his direction, the Department of Health and Human Resources created the Healthy Marriage Initiative, a program designed to shape and finance marriage promotion efforts throughout the states, and persuaded the Republican-controlled Congress to fund the initiative for five years at a cost of $500 million. The HHS simultaneously diverted $100 million within existing programs, including child support, to marriage promotion efforts. In in deference to the new common sense that welfare should go beyond the mere enforcement of economic obligations to actively promote the creation of traditional families. Alongside this increase in federal funding to marriage promotion efforts, Congress also authorized $250 million to finance Wade Horn's Federal Fatherhood Initiative. It is under Obama, however, that responsible fatherhood programs have truly flourished. Within the first few years of his administration, President Obama more than doubled the the funding for fatherhood initiatives, demoting marriage promotion to second place within the federal welfare agenda. The HHS now collaborates closely with the Department of Justice and the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships to design programs that are especially attuned to the experiences of low-income minority men. As a consequence, fatherhood programs are now fully integrated into the legal system and may be assigned as alternatives to jail terms for low-risk offenders or, include within a re-entry, or included within a re-entry program for former prisoners. Father absence plays an extraordinary role in Obama's political persona as both a biographical fact and a phenomenon he sees as defining the wider African-American experience. His social welfare agenda is unmistakably shaped by the fragile fatherhood discourse of left social conservatives, such as Ronald Mincy and Hillard Pouncey, but also testifies to the enduring influence of Moynihan in American social policy. In his political autobiography, The Audacity of Hope, Obama, Obama defends Moynihan against charges of racism and praises what he sees as the instinctive conservatism of the black middle classes. We should acknowledge that conservatives and Bill Clinton, this is a quote, he, we should acknowledge that conservatives and Bill Clinton were right about welfare as it was previously structured. He claims, but we also need to realize that work alone will not raise people out of poverty. What is also needed is a far-reaching campaign of moral and cultural rehabilitation of the kind envisaged by Moynihan. Our failure as progressives to tap into the moral underpinnings of the nation is not just rhetorical, Our fear of getting preachy may also lead us to discount the role that values and culture play in addressing some of our most urgent social problems. Yet, if Obama, like Moynihan, sees the renovation of fatherhood as key to solving the problem of racial and economic injustice, the imaginary of social welfare has utterly changed in the years since the publication of the Moynihan Report. Moynihan, after all, was writing at the height of welfare expansionism, and still hoping to extend the family wage to black men. His social conservatism was closely aligned with a social democratic vision of redistribution through the living wage. In the early 21st century, the redistributive promises of the post-war era have definitively faded into the distant past, even while he invokes the name of Moynihan then. What Obama offers instead is an alliance of social conservatism and neoliberalism that is more strictly reminiscent of the Gilded Age politics of family responsibility, although now fully implemented by the administrative structures of the state. Relegitimating family law. Much like their Gilded Age predecessors, the communitarian scholars associated with the Institute for Family Values are deeply invested in the project of family law reform, identifying it as an essential pillar in their long-term strategy to rehabilitate moral values. The Council on Family Law, an affiliate organization, brings together conservative legal scholars such as Mary Ann Glendon, Milton C. Regan Jr., uh, Margaret Brinig, and Carl E. Schneider, who are intent on reversing the trend toward the privatization of, of family law and have advocated such measures as the restoration of fault-based divorce or the introduction of religious alternatives to civil unions such as covenant marriage an experiment carried out with only moderate success in the state of Louisiana.
These scholars take direct aim at the, at the neoliberal law and economic school of Richard Posner, which they see as enabling the dissolution of the family through the con contractualization of family law. Like many legal scholars, they describe the recent history of family law reform in terms of a distinct trend toward privatization, that is, the replacement of state-sanctioned obligations by a system of private contractual ordering, a process they see as fully consonant with the aims of neoliberal legal theory. In the face of this trend, communitarian legal scholars assert the necessity of long-term, state-enforced obligations in marriage and parenthood. Without this guarantee, they argue, the family is deprived of its foundational role and the sexual disorder of fatherless families ensues. Neoliberal legal scholars are indeed hostile to the premise of civic norms as regulative principles of intimate life and are in principle inclined to support the generalization of private contractual ordering as a substitute for state-enforced civil contracts such as marriage. Yet we misunderstand their argument in favor of contractualization if we do not also recognize its limiting conditions. Having declared themselves a priori favorable to private ordering, neoliberal scholars make a crucial exception for intimate relationships that are liable to generate social costs or externalities, for example, in the form of illegitimate children or uninsured STIs, a problematic we will explore in further detail in Chapter 5. Richard Posner and Gary Becker have long expressed their distaste for no-fault divorce, not out of any overt moral concern with the decline of family life. The rising divorce rates of the late 20th century were an inevitable result of women's greater participation in the workforce, Becker insists, but because of the potential social costs involved in supporting dependent women and children. When women and men fail to privatize the costs of their sexual behavior, instead transferring the, these costs to the state, neoliberals make an exceptional case for the imposition of non-contractual obligations. In cases of marital dissolution, then, the legal responsibilities of marital and child support must take precedence over the wishes of the parties involved, and the state is more than justified in enforcing these responsibilities. Here it becomes clear how profoundly the neoliberal philosophy of sexual freedom has been, has been misrepresented in both scholarly and popular discourse. It is almost universally assumed, for instance, that neoliberal legal scholars must be sympathetic to, perhaps even ultimately responsible for, the jurisprudence of privacy that transformed sexual freedom into a limited constitutional right in the late 1960s and 1970s. Thus, thus a certain kind of left-wing critique of neoliberalism sees it as having inspired the individualist ethics of sexual choice, informing such landmark cases as the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973, and by extension all other cases involving the recognition of a constitutional right to sexual liberty. In fact, the opposite is true. A scholar such as Richard Posner is unequivocally hostile to the jurisprudence of sexual freedom, for the simple reason that a positive right to sexual liberty leads all too, all too easily to the conclusion that the state must not only allow, but also actively protect and enable the freedoms in question. Arguably, it was just such a line of reasoning that led to the brief extension of privacy jurisprudence to welfare recipients in the 1970s, a scenario that neoliberals have always understood and decreed as a form of state-subsidized personal irresponsibility. Instead, neoliberals support the more limited notion that private contractual freedom as opposed to a constitutional right to freedom, should be extended to all arenas of social and intimate life. On the proviso that the associated costs are fully internalized by the contracting parties. Failing this, neoliberals are no less willing than communitarians to invoke the necessity of non-contractual obligations in marriage and parenthood, and are more than prepared to call on their enforcement by the state. Despite their very real differences, then, communitarian and neoliberal legal scholars are united in their aversion to sexual rights discourse. Both are convinced that some limit must be imposed on sexual freedom, differing only on the question of whether these limits should be exceptional, the neoliberals, or foundational, the communitar communitarians. It is this convergence, no doubt, that explains why one of the most conservative scholars in the communitarian uh, tradition, Margaret, Margaret Brinig, 
also claims allegiance to the Law and Economics School, and why one of the most libertarian of Chicago School legal scholars, Richard A. Epstein, is also the most radical in his commitment to the non-negotiable nature of familial obligations. What Epstein recognizes perhaps more lucidly than any other law and economics scholar is that freedom of contract cannot exist without the ostensibly natural, non-contractual obligations of family. The rules of social welfare should therefore follow the basic pattern of natural obligation as it is perceived to arise within families. The task of neoliberal welfare reform is to transform this inclination into duty, and thus to derive an is from an ought, a precise translation of the poor philosophy of natural charity within the family.